One of my least favorite things um, as someone who drives a vehicle is a one-way road. You know, like in Old Town Louisville or, or a city where you kind of get stuck going in the, the square with the one-way roads, and if you miss that turn, if you take the wrong turn, you're stuck at like four different lights. You know what I'm talking about? That one-way road. I, whoever invented that, I don't know why they invented it, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we should reverse all that. We should just do all two-way roads. There is only one, a one-way road to heaven. There's only a one-way road to the Father, to God. There's only a one-way road to Christ, to salvation, to grace, to forgiveness, to eternal life. There's only a one-way road to a right relationship with God. There are not two, there are not three, there are not four. None of us have the ability or the right to create a path to reconciliation with God. God has determined that by sending his son. God has declared to us that there is only one name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. Humanity has always tried to make its way to God, to create a, a path to God that is not his path. We are all prone to creating God in our own image. And if we were to say, what is God like without any revelation from God, we would always be wrong. We would always be wrong. And so we've tried to climb mountains. We've tried to pursue paths that we've created that we're comfortable with, that we like, that, that allow us to contribute to our salvation and contribute to God's grace and add to what only he can do, and it is repulsive to God. It is foolishness to God. One of the most repulsive things you could do today is to claim to have exclusive truth, to have an exclusive way to a relationship with God, to have an exclusive Lord and Savior, to say Jesus Christ is the only Savior of humanity and the only way to be right with God. That is probably the most repulsive thing you could say to someone who disagrees with that idea. What has happened is that truth has been redefined. Truth has been reimagined. Truth has been made to be subjective and internal to where truth actually comes out of you. Truth does no longer come to you from God. Don't miss that. Truth has been redefined to where truth now comes out of the individual. It's manifested, right? You hear this word like, I'm going to manifest this, right? Truth is now manifested out of you rather than truth being received as something that comes to you directly from God. And as I pondered this, even this morning, as I pondered this shift, this reimagining, a redefinition of what truth is, for the first time, I saw the absolute ruthless arrogance of it. To say that you can create and manifest truth and that truth resides in you and then stems from you is the human God complex. It is the most arrogant thing that I could ever imagine. Because Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way and the truth. And now... The world turns around and says, I create truth. I manifest truth. I determine truth. I, what I feel and think and desire, that is what is true. And that is one of the most arrogant things someone could ever say. My way, my beliefs, my truth, my desires, my dreams, my plans, my, 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 my. Everything now starts with the individual and the gospel chops that in half. And it says, Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is otherworldly. So look with me at John 14 again as Rocky read it. John 14, we have another famous I am statement from Jesus, which is really the center of the text. This comes on the tail end of Jesus saying, I'm going to leave and go to my Father. There is room for you. I go to prepare a place. I will come again, and I will bring you to be with myself. And Jesus is such a brilliant teacher. He is the teacher premier. And so he asks leading questions and he makes leading comments, which he does in verse 4. And you know the way to where I'm going. You know the way to where I'm going. What a leading question. What wisdom. 
He knows exactly what he's about to try to expose and even teach and pull out of them. And Thomas in verse 5 says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas says, we don't know, but we want you to tell us. How can we know? We don't know, but we want to know. How can we know the way? And verse 6, Jesus said to him, the famous I am statement, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father, that is God the Father, except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. There is a one-way road to the Father. There is only one way to a right relationship with God. There is only one full and final and complete revelation of the truth of who God is and what he requires and the path of salvation. And there is only one who gives eternal life. The one appointed by the Father to judge the living and the dead, to save sinners on the cross, to raise the dead on the last day, the one that is coming back. He is the only source of eternal life. And so when I think of these famous words, way, truth, and life, I have three words of explanation that might help bring out the concept. First, for Jesus being the way, this speaks to the idea of reconciliation. He is the only way to be reconciled to God. Because he is the only sacrifice for sinners. He's the only son of God. He's the only judge of the world. He's the only Messiah in Christ. He's the only one who was raised from the dead after he paid the price for our sins on the cross. He's the only one who has been exalted above heavenly angels to the right hand of the Father. And the name he has inherited is superior, superior to angels. Because the name he's received is more excellent. There is only one where the scriptures speak to him as God. Your throne, O oh God, speaks to Christ. So Jesus is the way to be reconciled to God because he is one with God and he is the only sacrifice that can take away your sins. His blood is the only means by which you can be justified before God, right with God, forgiven by God, and enter the kingdom of God. There is no reconciliation with God apart from the cross. There is no entrance into the kingdom apart from faith in Jesus Christ and his cross. There is no new birth apart from faith in Jesus Christ who was crucified and raised. He is the only way. The only way. For you and for me. For man and for woman. For child. He is the only way. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. There's the cross, which is the testimony given at the proper time. It is not that you and I act and create a path to God. We do not reconcile ourselves to God. <clears throat> it is impossible to do so. God, in love, reconciles us to himself. It is not that God looks out and finds something lovely in you, because he does not. He finds darkness in you and me. He finds sin in you and me. He finds murder in you and me. He finds hatred in you and me. He finds greed in you and me. He finds partiality in you and me. He finds hatred in you and me. He, fi he finds bitterness in you and me and unforgiveness in you and me. So it is not that God sees something lovely in you and then loves you and moves towards you. It is that he is lovely and that as he is love, and as he places his sights of love on you, then you become lovely to him because he is love. Not because you are lovely. <clears throat> and then he makes you new in Christ Jesus. And he makes you lovely to him in Christ Jesus by the blood of Jesus and the spirit of Christ within you. He makes you lovely by uniting you to Jesus Christ. This is the center of who we are in him. He is the one who moves towards us. He is the one who did not spare his son. He is the only way because he's the only one from God who's one with God and who accomplished the redeeming work God sent him to do. He is also the truth. He is also the truth. We thought about the way as reconciliation. Think of the truth as illumination. Illumination. That Jesus fully, finally, totally, completely in the flesh, face to face, reveals exactly what God is like. The only way to God, he reveals that. He reveals the teaching of God, the truth of God, 
the glory of God, the image of God, the way to God, the works of God, the mercy of God, the justice of God, the authority of God. Could someone grab me some water? Would that be okay, church? Can we take a water break? I need like a water cooler or something. Something's going on. Got a little frog down there. Thank you so much. We'll keep going. Jesus is the truth in that he illumines exactly what God is like. He illumines the exact way to God. He is the truth. 1 John 5.20, same author, same biblical author, 1 John 5.20, love this. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, illumination, so that we know him who is true, and we are in him who is true true in his son Jesus Christ he is the true God and eternal life he has come as the truth to give us understanding that he is the truth that he is the true and living God if you got some coffee take a sip if you got some water take a sip let's do it together Mm. gosh that's good just started using my Brita filter at home again Tastes real nice. There's a big difference between tap and Brita. I will say that. Huge difference. He is the truth, the way, the reconciliation. He is the illumination of who God is and the path to God. He gives us understanding. There is no true understanding of God and salvation apart from the person of Jesus Christ. None. None. I mean, think about this. Paul even goes on to say that, that Jesus Christ is wisdom for us from God. There is no wise person in the world who denies Jesus Christ. The only way to be wise is to understand and know him because to know and understand God, you must know and understand and believe in Jesus Christ. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. God is like Jesus, exactly like him. Everything that contradicts God's revelation of himself and testimony of himself through Jesus Christ is a lie. That's why the most common place in church history for 2,000 years that you find heresy is a false teaching about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If you find heresy, it is always connected to the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is always connected to an error concerning him. But Jesus is not just the way, the reconciliation. He's not just the truth, the illumination of God. He is also the life. And I want you to think about this word. He is, for us, the source of regeneration. Reconciliation, illumination, regeneration. He is the only one who can bring you into a new life, which is the new birth, which is regeneration, which is eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life is not speaking primarily in the Gospel of John about length of life, although that is true. It is a length of life. Eternal life has started now, though, not just then. It has started now for the person who is born again. Eternal life is a quality of life, not just a length of life. It is life in Christ and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, connected and united to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. That is life. In fact, eternal life is defined by Jesus himself. John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 1 John 5.20, we read it earlier. It says at the very end, he is the true God, and he is his person. He, he is eternal life. To know Jesus is to have life. And by knowing Jesus, then you actually know God the Father as well. Eternal life is entering a relationship with God by faith in his word, faith in the gospel that's preached to you. And the Holy Spirit uses the gospel that's preached to you to draw you to Christ and unite you and raise you up with Jesus Christ to a new regenerated life where you stand in a position of born again. You stand in a position of justified. You stand in a position of peace with God. You stand in a position of adopted by your Father. You stand in grace, Romans chapter 5. 
that he is life for us. He regenerates us through his word and the spirit, and he unites us to Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And there is salvation in no one else, Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else. There's no other way to reconciliation, no other truth of illumination, and no other life that is regeneration. Everything goes through the one-way road of Jesus Christ. Everything. Now, what's fascinating to me is right after this, Jesus enters a pointed discussion about his identity and his identity in relationship to the Father. And at the end, I'll tie those together, or at least I'll attempt to do so. But look with me how he says in verse 7, here's another leading comment. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. See that? See, the point is, you can't know God, the Father, unless you know Jesus. That's why anybody who claims to believe in God or know, know God or, or relate to God apart from Jesus Christ is, 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 is not relating to God. They're lying. It's not true. They're still lost. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I bet they're standing there wiping their brow saying, Phew, that was close, you know? Like, thank you, Jesus. You're actually, you know, affirming that from now on, we do know the Father and we have seen him. But what a strange comment for them. I mean, try to put yourself in their shoes. All of this theology is coming to them, like, immediately, a million miles an hour. They, they are not 2,000 years removed from Jesus Christ, and they don't have 2,000 years of church history and a full Bible. And, I mean, Jesus' statements are stunning, absolutely stunning. It, he says, from now on, you know the Father, and you have seen him. They never thought of themselves as Jews that way. They never thought, hey, I, I, they never thought of themselves just in, like, this, this, this personal access to the Father, right? They thought about them in, in like, a community under the God of Israel, in covenant with the God of Israel, but, but the way in which, Je what I'm saying is the way in which Jesus is saying this is, is it's very personal, it's very direct access. And that's because the Son of God is standing right in front of them. And he's saying, if you know me, you would know my Father also. Let's keep going. Verse 8, Philip said to him, I love Philip, I love Thomas, we often give Thomas a hard time. Verse 5, he's the one like responding, right? He's the one interacting. He's the one thinking hard. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Whoa. I mean, I mean, think about what he's saying here. If you were to go to Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up and seated on a throne and his glory fills the temple and the train of his robe is so long that it fills the temple and everything's shaking and everybody's terrified and the angels won't even look at God and they cover their feet and they cry out, holy is the Lord, holy, holy, holy. And, and Philip just kind of casually says, show us the Father. Wait, you, you're asking Jesus to basically rend open the heavens in, in Philip's mind to rend open the heavens and show us the Father. That's what Philip's thinking. He's not thinking that, that I can see what God's like in Jesus. He's thinking, show us the Father. He's obviously not here. We obviously can't see him right now. But what Jesus does is he completely flips this on them, and he says, if you, you, you know me, if you know me, you know the Father. Now watch this, verse 9. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? I often joke with Aaron in the house. She jokes with me. Have you been with me so long? <laughs> you still don't know me? We get good laughs. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on account of the works themselves. Wow. Wow. People try to say that Jesus doesn't claim to be divine or be God. That is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. Look what he says. If you've seen me, verse 9, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Now, is Jesus saying that there's no distinction between the Son and the Father? Is he saying that there's just one person in God? Is he saying, I'm the same thing as the Father, and the Father is the same thing as me, and, 
and that God is just a, a modalistic God where, where sometimes God is Father, sometimes God feels like being the Son, and then sometimes he wakes up and he feels like being the Spirit. And then all of a sudden, he gets sucked back into this ethereal God, and now, now he wants to be the Father again. No. <clears throat> Jesus is not saying there's no distinction between him and the Father. He's saying if you look at me, you see exactly what God's glory is like. God's nature. God's mercy, justice, righteousness, holiness, power, wisdom. In fact, he goes on to distinguish between him and the Father in verse 10. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me? I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. This is Trinitarianism 101. That there is one God, and, and this is our favorite thing to talk about with Judah. There is, there is one God, and he is three persons. And Judah says, one God, three persons. Three persons, one God. And all three persons live in each other. This is called mutual indwelling. You need to know theology, church. You need to read theology. You need to study it. You need to understand your God. Jesus is describing mutual indwelling, that the Father dwells in the Son, and the Son dwells in the Father. Theology is not for just pastors and seminary professors and people who like reading. Theology is for the believer because it's in the Word of God. I'm in the Father. The Father is in me. And Jesus is saying, if you want to know what the Father's like, the invisible Father... Well, I have come for that purpose. I have come to show you who he is. And he goes on to say in verse 10, I do not speak. What I'm saying to you is not on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. So my words are from the Father. They're under his authority. My works are from the Father. And more than that, verse 11, guys, look at verse 11. Believe me, I'm in the Father. And the Father's in me. Or else, believe on account of of the works themselves. So if Jesus were walking around and no one had ever proclaimed him or identified him or, or pointed to him, there had been no voice from heaven, no Holy Spirit descending like a dove at his baptism, that he was just born, no announcement, no information, right? You would not look at him when he was on earth and you, you wouldn't look at him and say that's God's son and that he's one in the Father. You wouldn't do that, although that's true. But once Jesus grows up, and once Jesus starts opening his mouth and teaching in the temple, and once Jesus starts doing signs that have never been seen in the history of the world, you start paying attention. How do you know and see the glory of God in Jesus? You see it through his words and his works. He even says, if you don't believe what I'm saying, just taking me at my word, then at least look at what I've done. At least look at me when I, when I turn water into wine, when I, when I heal people who are, are, are mute and deaf and demon-possessed and <clears throat> demons run down a hill inside of a man's body and, and bow before me and I, I walk on water and I, and I transport a boat to shore with immediacy and I feed 5,000 and 4,000 and plus women and children and at least if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least look at the hard, cold facts that the Father is working in me and that I'm from God, and I'm the way to God, I am the life, and I am the truth. Believe the works. Believe the works. This morning, by the way, a sermon or a teaching, if you teach an ABF or teach somewhere else, a teaching, like, you're never done preparing until you walk up there and deliver it. You never know what's going to come out either, by the way. Uh, it's a hazardous thing, so... But I just sat at my desk smiling and giggling because as, as I was thinking about this idea, I thought of a 2001 Michael W. Smith, of all things. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you to see you. I live. It's out of my range, okay? We're going to stop. <laughs> Shining in the light of glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. I just did that to see who went to church camp and who was a back row Baptist. That's it. <laughs> no, but why? the reason I thought of that is because it's an Isaiah 6 song. Like he, He's thinking about, we want to see you high and lift up. It's a great song. It's a, it's, it's a great concept. We want to see you exalted. But what caught my, my attention was open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you shine the light of your glory. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to climb to heaven into the mystery to see the glory of God. The glory of God has come down to you in Jesus. 
Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you shining in the light of your glory. All you have to do is look to Jesus, believe on Jesus, submit to Jesus, worship Jesus, and follow Jesus, and then you will see God's glory. The way you understand God and understand his word, the way you enter the realm of salvation and new life and new birth in the kingdom is by faith, receiving the Lord Jesus by faith. And then you are a person of faith seeking understanding. It is by faith we understand. It is by faith we live in Christ. It is by faith we enter the kingdom of God. And then we begin to understand more and more and more and more and more. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, to see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. I told you weeks back, months back, that there was a country song by Larry Fleet where I find God, and he talks about natural, natural uh, ways in which he sees God, and certainly you can see something of God in creation. It's Romans 1. But where we find God is ultimately in Jesus Christ. Where we find salvation is in Jesus Christ. Where we find mercy is in Jesus Christ. The way we grow spiritually is by all of our teaching being coming through, if you will, the person and glory and work of Jesus Christ. Evangelism is about Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised in his glorious kingdom. Spiritual discipleship in the home. Spiritual discipleship of grandparents to grandkids. Spiritual encouragement from brother and sister to brother and sister in the church. Evangelism in your neighborhood or at your workplace. Even Christian moral instruction, if it is detached from the person and work and identity of Jesus Christ, it is not healthy. And in many cases, it's just wrong. But if, if it is centered on Jesus, if it is founded upon him and his word and his promises and his death for our sins, his resurrection, his ascension, and his second coming and his glorious kingdom, then it is truly and properly Christian. It is Christian. In Luke 24, Jesus is on this road with two disciples who, who think that things are over on the road to Emmaus. And he s sneaks up and appears and asks some leading questions and s conceals his identity. And then, you know, he basically begins to unfold to them the entire Old Testament. And as he unfolds the entire Old Testament on this seven-mile walk, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's a radical way of teaching the gospel, of teaching the scriptures, of interpreting the scriptures, and of living the Christian life. We proclaim to people who are lost, Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised and his kingdom and his lordship and his mercy and his love and their need to repent and believe. When we disciple believers, we start with, who is Jesus Christ? What has he done? What is your current identity in him? And then we build upon that with Christian moral instruction, Christian ethics. Christian ethics are never detached from Christ and his finished work. They're always rooted in Christ and his finished work. It is because Jesus has made you new that you now live new. It is because Jesus has freed you from sin that you now live free from sin. I'm stealing a term from Abraham Curavilla at Dallas Seminary, he's a preaching professor there. He's actually been here once, and he, he calls Christian moral instruction Christ-iconic instruction. I love that. So I'm stealing that. Christ-iconic instruction. Meaning that even Christian moral ethical instruction is rooted in who Jesus is and the desire and the effort to become like Jesus Christ so that we display what he is like to everybody around us, thus glorifying him and thus glorifying the Father. And all of that, just like in the letters of Paul, are rooted in that God has done something in Jesus to save you. And he's made you a new creature, a new person. You have a new family, a new identity. Now live accordingly. Everything is about Christ. All of creation is about Christ. All of your life is about Christ. All things spiritual. We were joking in our city group the other day, actually yesterday, and, and we were just talking about normal stuff and patio covers and all kinds of stuff. And, and it just reminded me that all things can be spiritual, that all things truly are, that everything is filtered through our union with Jesus and our need for him and life lived under his sovereign universal lordship. In all things, we are his. We are the sheep of his pasture. 
And I don't know about you, but I can rest today knowing that he has purchased me by his blood. And that I know, I know that I know, and I would die for it here. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I hope if you haven't embraced him as Savior and put your faith in him, that you would do that right now as we take communion. That we call upon the name of Jesus saying, I need you. Forgive me. Save me. Rescue me. Our Father, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for Jesus Christ. We know that he is the sovereign Lord and that there is no other way of reconciliation, no other truth of illumination, and there is no other life of regeneration. Thank you that even though the way is narrow, that it is perfect, it is sufficient. Pray that our lives would be just consumed by our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That our affections would be on him because then our affections are on you, Father, as well. Because you are in him and he is in you. And the Holy Spirit is within us. And, and we are, just can't believe that we are caught up into the glorious love and joy and, and, and majesty and mercy of the Trinity. It's wonderful. Thank you for your precious word that, that is so precious to us. Pray that those in this room and those listening or who will listen in the future would be saved. You'd save your elect, your chosen children through this gospel. We pray that as we commune with the Lord Jesus by the Holy Spirit and the sacrament of the communion, that you would strengthen our faith, strengthen our mind and our soul and our fellowship in the Lord. Thank you so much for this sacrament. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.